Hello, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to take a look at chapters 18, 19, and 20 of the Scarlet Letter and take a look at what happens and a little bit of analysis of how this fits in to Hawthorne's style. Now, chapter 18 is part of this section of the story where we're still out in the woods, and it's called A Flood of Sunshine. And here's where we learn a little bit more about Hester. We learned that this Scarlet Letter has made her an outcast. So for all of these years now, it's we're on to seven years, it's kept her apart from other people. And this has taught her a point of view and let her see things that others couldn't see. And Hawthorne describes it as, the Scarlet Letter was her passport into regions other women dared not tread. And this has given her a strength and a perspective so that she can see a future for herself in Arthur Dimsdale and Pearl apart from the town. Dimsdale, on the other hand, for these last seven years has been trapped. He didn't have this public confession. He got on the scaffold in the dark of night. He wouldn't speak out at, that, at Hester's original punishment and has been kind of lying to himself that he's doing this all in order to, for the good of the town because he's such a good minister and he wants to keep doing good works um, and in his ministerial position. But he hasn't earned this, um, this freedom that Hester has learned, that it's time that, yes, it's been difficult, but it has made her strong and she's able to do things and see things that he can't see. And the author reminds us that his crime was not intentional. Hawthorne tells us it was a sin of passion, not of principle or even purpose. In other words, he didn't set out to have this affair with Hester. He didn't mean to. It just kind of was in the heat of the moment. So he says to himself, you know, he's already sinned. He's not a perfect person. He might as well go ahead and grab some happiness now since his life is already done. By the way, there's echoes in here, if you remember back to the Crucible with John Proctor, saying, I might as well give them this lie. I'm not a perfect person because he'd already had this affair with Abigail. So, you know, what's, all, what's lost if he goes ahead and signs the false confession? We see a little bit of this kind of thinking going on in Dimsdale's head. He says, you know, I'm already kind of a bad person inside. I've already committed one sin. At this point, you know, since I am irrevocably doomed, he says, wherefore should I not snatch the solace allowed to the condemned culprit before the execution. He says, I'm already going to be punished for this sin all these years. Let me go have a life out here with Hester for whatever life is left to me. And we have this moment of freedom out here in the forest. Arthur Dimsdale says he can't live without Hester. Hester says he, she won't leave him. He feels joy again. He, says he doesn't even recognize. He said, what is this emotion? For seven years, I haven't felt anything like this. Hester rips the scarlet letter off, throws it over on the riverbank. This little drawing here, you kind of see it laying over there. Let's, takes off the cap, lets her hair down. And the author describes her beauty and her youth and her femininity all flooding back into her at this moment. And the sun comes out. It's like all of nature is shining down on them out here in the forest, unbound by uh, all of the rules and traditions of the village. Now, there's one more person who's part of this little unit, though, and that's Pearl, and she kind of gets her own little chapter here. Chapter 19 is called The Child at the Brookside. Now, we already saw when Hester and Pearl went into the forest that Pearl seemed to just belong there, that she seems to be a part of it. She's a little bit like the sunshine that dances away and like the brook that they don't really know what its source is and this mystery and beauty, and they can't really predict what's going to happen next. And Arthur Dimsdale, like, almost for the first time, takes a good look at Pearl, and he says he's been afraid really to look at her for all of these years. And part of it is that he's been afraid that she looks a little bit like him, that he might recognize himself in her and that other people might catch on that he's the baby daddy here. But as the author points out, Pearl is the symbol of their union. And out here in the forest where she was conceived, we have Hester and Dimsdale renewing their love. We have Pearl there, who's the living symbol of this love that they had, of this moment that they shared. And this all seems to belong. And we have this great moment again where the sun is now coming out and everything seems to be in harmony.
the same way that they notice that the stream seems to be like a boundary between these two worlds, Arthur Dimsdale still has to go back into the town. So as he leaves the forest and comes back in, he starts to wonder whether it had all been a dream. He turns around to look over his shoulder. It's like, are they real? Are they actually still there? And he goes over in his mind the plan that they made. They're going to escape to Europe. They've decided that they can't just go off into the forest of the New World, that Dimsdale doesn't have enough strength. He's too weak for that to go live among the natives and, and just make their own New World. So they're going to go back across the ship. And Hester, through all of the good works that she's done, has made the acquaintance of this captain. And she says, I can get us passage on this ship, and I can get us there, and it's going to be sailing out of the harbor in four days. So we're going to leave. We're getting out of here. It's a done deal. Now, Dimsdale really likes this. He says this fits really well. He enjoys this freedom that he hasn't felt, this getting rid of this pain. We see the strength coming back into him. And he thinks to himself, this is the perfect time to leave because he has the biggest sermon of the year, this big religious festival and event, and he has to preach to this huge crowd. And that's in three days. He said, you know, I'll go out with a bang. I'll do my last official duty. I'll win some more souls to Christ. I'll be the best minister. I'll give the best sermon they've ever seen. And then I'll just disappear. And he says, you know, if this is still the best thing to do. I know I'm a sinful person, but I'm hiding my sin because it's for the good of all of these people. See all the, these souls I'm saving and all this good stuff that I'm doing because I'm a minister and I couldn't do any of this if they knew the real me. But Hawthorne is reminding us here, the narrator steps in and says, no man can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. So the narrator sort of interposing in the storyline here saying, mm, you may not get out of it quite that easily, Dimsdale. And as Dimsdale comes back out of the forest, we see this change in him. Uh, the author tells us it was the same town, but the same minister returned not from the forest. And he feels really free, but then he's like this little kid that has you know, broken a window and says, well, I already broke one window. Let me go and smash in all the windows I see. And he goes through this whole series of temptations. And Hawthorne shows us uh, him meeting up with these different people. There's this kindly old minister who comes along and and Dimsdale's all rude to him. There's a widow who's all sad because her children have died and her husband has died. And Dimsdale can't remember a single word of scripture in that moment to comfort her. Um, there's this beautiful young girl that comes along that has just decided to be baptized and has just come into the religious fold. And Dimsdale knows that she idolizes him, that he's her minister and the one that brought her to God. And he has this idea that he could whisper something really ugly to her, really nasty, and completely warp her whole sense of what's right and wrong. He sees this group of children playing. He says, you know, I could go up and I could use some of that language that I learned from these sailors, and I could say a few words to them and just watch their reaction. I mean, he's got all of these little, just like, you know, a little devil sitting on his shoulder saying all of these terrible things that he could be doing. So the question comes up, is Arthur Dimsdale free now that he's made this decision to leave behind his old life and follow Hester, or is he just tempted? He runs into Mistress Hibbins. Remember, that's the governor's sister who's rumored to be a witch, and she recognizes something different in him right away and says, aha, you've been out in the forest, haven't you? You've met the black man. I recognize that. And he's like, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. But if you think about it, his bargain is Hawthorne, the narrator, steps in again and tells us, tempted by a dream of happiness, he had yielded himself with deliberate choice, as he had never before done, to what he knew was deadly sin. In other words, his original sin was a crime of passion. It was born out of love. It was not intentional uh, when he had that moment that he slept with Hester out in the woods so many years ago. But this time, he's kind of acting in cold blood. This is not a spur-of-the-moment decision. This is a very thoughtful choice to run off with what he knows is another man's wife. And even though, yes, we believe that their love is sanctioned by nature and all of that, it's not fitting within the confines of society and with the other promises and vows that he's made as a minister. And this choice, this, this choice now not for freedom, but this choice to deliberately commit a sin, is infecting, as the author tells us, his moral fiber.
And then we come to what's actually one of my favorite scenes in the whole book. So here comes Arthur Dimsdale back in, and here comes Roger Chillingworth. And Chillingworth knows that Hester was going to go tell Dimsdale that Chillingworth is her husband and that he's been trying to get at Dimsdale all of this time. And Dimsdale now knows that Chillingworth is the husband who's been trying to undermine him this whole time. But the two of them pretend like none of this has happened. So you have almost this kind of cat fight thing that happens here. They make a few puns here. I, Chillingworth is all, oh, you know, sit down, you look a little tired, you know, you have this big sermon to preach, can I help you with anything? And, you know, you need to rest because you don't want your people to think that their minister is going to be gone in another year. And Chillingworth is meaning gone as in dead because he's so sick and he's about to die, it looks like, any minute now. Um, and Arthur Dimsdale comes back with, yes, his min their minister might be gone to another world. In this case, he means back off to old Europe, like out of this place, like I'm out of here and you don't even know this. And so you have this little bit where neither one of them will admit that they both know what, what's up with the, with the other. But uh, Dimsdale feels great. He feels stronger. He actually eats this huge meal and he takes his old sermon and he burns it and says he feels like at that moment, he's got a direct pipeline to heaven, and that he, the, the um, analogy that Hawthorne gives us is that he's like an instrument, he's an organ, but he's a pipe organ, and all of the stuff is pouring down like a sound coming out of an instrument, and he writes this huge, long sermon, and he says, even though he is a foul organ pipe, he still feels like this is heaven's words out on this paper now in front of him. And so our chapter ends with kind of this total cliffhanger. What's Chillingworth going to do now? Is he going to find some way to get his final revenge here? What is Arthur Dimsdale's new sermon about? Is he, are he and Hester and Pearl actually going to make it out of town? And to find all of this out, you have to stay tuned for the end of the book in the last few chapters.